a postdoctoral fellow at the ULB, having conducted anthropological research on various social phenomena in urban China. Public space, as a key theme of the Genesis project, has been central to my various research topics, from retirees singing songs of their Maoist youth in Beijing's public parks, to young rural to urban migrants in Shanghai negotiating their everyday worries and future related anxieties in spaces like bookstores, public libraries, or cosmopolitan looking cafes where some of my informants worked. I have been interested in how public space with its aesthetics and sociality can be involved in the making of subjectivities, but also how public space can be appropriated through collective expressive practices. And with regard to the latter, perhaps especially in the Chinese context, one question that often comes up is when something happens in public, to what extent can we as researchers ascribe a po political meaning to that practice? And this is something that is especially worth addressing when the people engaged in those very activities would not necessarily call what they do in political or sometimes even reject the category outright. The political dimension of popular practices in public spaces is a fairly common question in China scholarship. But collaborating on the Genesis project, I've begun to look at it from a special perspective, which is that of public affects. This is something that emerged as I was working on one of the key outputs of the Genesis project, which is Vanessa Franville and Gwenelle Gafric's edited volume, China's Youth Cultures and Collective Spaces, to which I contributed a conclusive chapter. So in this book, you have contributors examining a range of youth cultural practices. To name but a few, you find chapters on a hip hop contest, a indie rock concerts, an Uyghur soap opera, um, singing performances by LGBTQ groups, uh, performances of young rural migrants at uh, Chinese New Year Gala, etc. And one question that is often taken up either implicitly or explicitly by the contributors is whether these practices have a political potential or whether they can be viewed as forms of resistance. And reading through the chapters as I was working on the conclusions, I realized that something that was recurrent and nonetheless left unattended was that the affective tonalities of the practices examined were by and large positive. So whatever the content, it was often about being humorous, uh, playful, cheerful, joyful, uh, positive, etc. And this is something that is especially important in the context of post-reform China because since the early 2000s, the poly state has been actively promoting happiness, optimism, resilience as norms of public effects. And one illustration of this is the pervasiveness of the slogan Zheng Nang Liang, positive energy, uh, borrowed from positive psychology, but which has made its way into everyday language, particularly among the youth. This promotion of positivity intervenes at a moment where scholars consider that forms of distress, depression, anxieties, all kinds of negative effects are, if not on the rise, at least most, more visible in the context of China due to its social and political uh, context. But returning to the chapters, the cultural practices examined by the contributors, uh, it was like somehow a uh, positive affective tonality has become conditional to public appearance and thereby erasing or limiting the sharing and expression of negative effects. This is something that is important to consider when we discuss the political potential of collective practices or forms of public presence in China, because then the question is not only what is the political potential of that practice or is it a form of resistance, but also to what extent does the affective tonality inflect the, the very political potential of that practice, if any. These reflections have led me to open up a new field of inquiry inspired by growing bodies of work in cultural studies and anthropology on negative effects as a potential ground for transformative agency. So the growing attention to the promotion of happiness and other positive feelings in China is also an invitation to consider its opposite. 
where do we locate negative effects in youth public cultures and what is the political potential of these effects when they are being shared and expressed and performed publicly. To address these issues, I gathered a group of scholars, about 10 colleagues from Asia, Europe and America, who examine a range of uh, public effects such as shame in public speaking groups or perplexity among youths engaging in develop self-development plans, uh, fear in Hong Kong, etc. And this is still work in progress, but you'll be able to find out the outcome of these discussions in a forthcoming issue of the journal How, a journal of ethnographic theory in December 2021.